All right. Hi, everybody. Tonight, we're going to be looking at John Muir Law's amazing nature journaling Bible. Yes, I know a lot of you have this on your bookshelf, but how many of these exercises in here have you actually done? I know that I haven't done a lot. That's why tonight, like a couple other times in the past, we're going to go through one of these step-by-step -step exercises together because it's so much fun when we do it in a group. Um, sorry about the timing stuff. I'm in the Galapagos, and for some reason, YouTube keeps getting confused about what time it is, and it's been a little bit challenging to figure it out, but um, here we are all at the same time, and since no one voted, really, I think we're going to do this step-by-step -step mushroom page. So go ahead, and the supplies you're going to need are a graphite pencil or a non-photo blue pencil. Um, I am going to also be using um, one of my favorite uh, drawing pins. This is a, um, a, a Pilot a Fudayaku uh, double-sided brush pin. I love these, and they're going out of um, production. But you could also use just darker lines of graphite. You could use a non-photo blue pencil like Jack does, and I think he's actually using um he he might be using a um he might be using a ballpoint pen in this one and then you're also going to want one of these um uniball signo pens um which are super good and i'll just uh share the link for those in the chat in case you don't have one of those already it's a super useful tool and yes, Ivea noticed it is the Spanish edition. Um, I think there's like 10 copies of these in the Galapagos that I brought down last year with the help of the Wild Wonder Foundation that donated them. And they've been distributed to a couple different schools and libraries and stuff like that. Uh, I was waiting to see if anybody would notice that the book was in Spanish. <laughs> um, so don't worry, I'll be translating as we go. And you can also kind of just follow along. I know when I was a kid, I hated, I never would do these follow along things. I would always just skip to the final drawing and try to copy it. But today we're gonna to try to be disciplined and we're going to go step by step. So let's do it. So first of all, get your graphite pencil ready and um, Let's get these basic shapes in. So it's saying to sketch in the proportions of the cap, the um, stem, and the vulva. And yes, this part is called a vulva. You can also call it an egg, but vulva is the, the technical name and is important for identification. So I'm going to start at the bottom. Um, maybe I'll make it a little bit bigger than that. Well, I can't believe I'm working with graphite. I almost never work with graphite anymore. So. This will be good practice for me. So I'm gonna make the, the vulva or the egg down here, the stem here, and the cap up here. So this is definitely a place where practicing your ellipses is going to come into play. There is perspective, linear perspective in this um, mushroom. So having some sense of uh, some, some amount of practice with those um, spheres in perspective and ellipses, the, the, um, the really fun one um, is going to help you out here. So let's try to get those proportions. The whole reason why we're doing this with graphite or non-photo blue pencil to begin with is because we're actually trying to be sticklers with uh, proportion, which usually is something I don't get super excited about. Um, but sometimes it's good to remember the difference between, um, you know, what, what comes easy to doing, what comes easy to you and rationalizing it and, um, doing something that would actually be useful for you to practice, even though it, it doesn't, um, feel like fun in the moment or something. All right. So step number two, I think we're ready for step number two. Oh, Eli's here. Candy's here. Hi, Candy. Hi, Eli. It uh, looks like Yvea has an interesting question here I'm going to share with everybody.
Oh, that is actually a really, really cool question, Isaiah. So next step is to draw the cap um, and the foot. Um, observe the vulva carefully. Uh, hopefully YouTube won't um, demonetize this video. I didn't think about that before. Um, its presence or absence is uh, important for identification, as I mentioned before. So this is probably, this could be an Amanita. Uh, Amanita genus has, um, has that, also sometimes called an egg underground. Um, it's important for mushroom identification. So now we're just going to go into some more details. It looks like he's, he's making his lines a little bit stronger as well. Um, but let's try to get, go from, oh, also notice, I didn't get this at first, but he's, he's catching that there is a, um, a thickness to this, um, this edge of the cap. So instead of sort of drawing it as like an imaginary um, two-dimensional shape, let's remember that there's going to be a three-dimensionality to the edge of this mushroom cap here. And then that there's that, that edge doesn't really match up with this sort of surface that has these cracks in it. So those cracks are really fun to draw. Don't over pattern them. And notice how they, they get skinnier as they get towards the edge of this ellipse, it looks like to me. Or maybe they don't get skinnier, maybe they just disappear. And then on the backside, it's a little bit asymmetrical. So add in some asymmetry to that shape. Amanitas are usually very symmetrical, very Apollonian um, mushrooms. I think Apollo was uh, a god of order. And certain types of beauty match that focus on order and symmetry. Less exuberant, perhaps. So one thing I'm noticing that I'm doing is my line quality because I'm I'm sort of doing that thing where you go like this little by little and your line quality actually ends up being pretty bad. Um, that happens sometimes when you're worrying about proportion too much. You can lose the the freeness, um, even though it's it's less exact. Sometimes these these longer lines, these lines that you make with your whole wrist are often uh, much better than the ones you make with the little finger movements. Okay, got that. Now let's get the vulva. Um, haven't been ended by uh, YouTube hasn't shut this down yet. So I um, guess we're going to get away with it for mushroom sake tonight. So this is really cool here. Let's pay attention to this because um, and if you have your book um, at home, you can open up to this page for, for certain details. But if you don't have the book at home, I will try to um, show it and and up close for these kind of things. But here is, there's a couple things going on here that will really help suggest three dimensionality of this. Um, so let's pay really close attention to these types of overlap here, because that's going to help us with our sense of, of three dimensionality. So what I notice is that um, this goes down, but then back here, it's coming up and around. And it also is turning into like a three-dimensional lip right there. The outside is a little bit more ragged. Maybe not, maybe that was too ragged. Then it comes back around. There's that three-dimensional lip again, sort of challenging shape to draw. But these are also things you can kind of practice even from imagination if you practice drawing basic shapes. Practicing drawing basic basic shapes doesn't sound sexy, but it's really important. And uh, the more that you can manipulate those shapes in your mind, the easier it will be to notice them um, when you see them in the, in, in the real world. And then equally important is I'm seeing the inside of this shape now on this side. And he's probably going to do something with light and dark that will make that part stand out. So as you see that, how we sort of try to show that this shape goes back around the back and that it has substance to it, three-dimensionality to it. I'm not going to worry about this texture that he has there down at the bottom. I can add that later.
And okay, next. So, um, so here's an interesting part. So the gills all direct to this point right here. So what he wants us to do is not mess up the lines that we put for the gills. So we're creating an imaginary point up here in the mushroom up here um, that all of these gills are going towards. So when we draw these, uh, a lot of times when we draw things like this, um, we're not really thinking about where stuff is going. And that's how you end up with these, these mistakes. And then here, like on the, the page on drawing flowers in perspective, he shows what the common, the common mistakes are. And they're often similar, like here, the petals don't all um, line up at the base. So sometimes you have to imagine the internal structure and where these gills um, are all going to. So let's get those gills in. And remember, they're, if you want to, if it helps you, go ahead and draw them going all the way up to this dot up here. So these are all radial coming from that dot there. Um, and then we're going to draw these ones. They actually, the same things are on this little rim here. So this is hard to see if you don't have the book at home, but let me try to point it out to you here. Notice how oh, this camera is so much better than, this is just my phone, but it um, works so much better than the camera I used to use for this stuff. Um, notice how there's these lines here. So I think they're actually the same gills um, when they go over, but he wants us to notice that they actually can create like an X where they they intersect with these, um, these other gills. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw those lines in now and try to remember that they are, um, I guess they're perpendicular to the way this cap, um, the direction, the line of this cap coming down. So these ones here are obvious because they line up, right? So see those. But then as you come up here, they go this way and that's counterintuitive. So try to get those right. Sounds like one of the neighbors doing a little bit random nighttime construction. And yes, it is completely dark here in the Galapagos. It's seven o'clock, but it gets dark at six every single day of the year, pretty much. Only a few degrees south of the equator here, almost right on the equator. Okay, so get those lines in. Let me show you how, how mine came out. You might be ahead of me. Usually when you follow along with one of these, you, you get ahead of me because you're not talking as much. Um, that's fine. Hopefully you can see the page on the book or if you have the book at home. Uh, maybe someone could put um, the link to Jock's website, the book on his website. Um, I think I put I think I put it in the description. Also, so if you look below the video, you'll see in the description. OK, so we're ready to go on to step number four. So I think I'm going to adjust this so you can see everything best. Oh, let me show you something real quick. I think I got most of it off, but this is my waterproof uh, nature journal that I've, um, I, I swam out in the ocean and nature journal this marine iguana that was three-legged marine iguana last year. Um, and I used it in the, in, the, in the rainforest and stuff too, including in the canopy, nature journaling these poison dart frogs in the canopy. But this year, the place where I'm staying in the Galapagos, I'm, I'm staying in the highlands of Santa Cruz, and it's way more humid here. And mold has been growing even on this. Mold grew on my backpack. Mold has been growing on this sketchbook. Uh, mold has been growing on all kinds of things, um, which is crazy. Last year, mold was growing on me, um, but this year it hasn't grown on me yet, so I'm trying not to complain too much it weirdly it's growing mostly on synthetic things but i think it's been growing on things that have salt so like i'm not i'm no longer recommending um using right in the rain in the ocean so if you remember that video it has bite marks because i was basically holding this in my mouth and swimming to this small island 
um, in Galapagos. I'm no longer recommending these for salt water because I think the salt gets in there and once salt is in there, it can never, in humid conditions, it will always absorb moisture from the air in humid conditions. So um, it's definitely still a, a really tough uh, sketchbook and they have these ones that are all blank pages, but I'm no longer recommending these for ocean stuff um, unless you're going to be like finishing it very quickly. So like this is a lot of pages um, for like a specialized journal. Um, if you use it in the ocean once and then you save it for a year and try to use it in another wet place, that could be a problem. Maybe one of the smaller ones that has fewer pages would be better for the ocean. But just want to give you that um, product update. Uh, one other product update real quick is I mentioned this. Um, I've been experimenting with these miniature printers for, for printing photos as stickers as a, as a nature journaling strategy. And I've been having really bad luck with this Kodak one. It's called Kodak Step. And um, just today I kept trying to print photos from this recent camping trip that I did with kids. And um, I kept having the, the things getting jammed the paper, the sticker paper getting jammed. So I don't know if that's just because of the humidity here, but um, if you and, and saw my previous video and were interested in getting one of these, just a, a, a caveat there to um, be aware that it might not be the most dependable thing. And maybe that's because I'm in like challenging conditions, but I just wanted to put that out there because I talk about a lot of products on the show and um, I want to make sure that I'm like letting updating people about uh, my experiences and in testing them. Okay, so we got to uh, number three. We're ready to go on to number four. So let me move this up here a little bit so you all can see. Oh, I just need to move this up. That's what I should do. Okay, there we go. All right, so we're down here, number four. Um, we're going to make the gills closer to the stem stand out more and darker. And then the ones closer to the edge are gonna show up less, which is, is, is kind of interesting. I think that has to do with the angle that they're at and which ones become more visible. So go ahead and start adding in more gills. Those original lines were sort of just guidelines. Guidelines. But don't forget that you do still have this point up here that they should all be um, leading up to that. It's really easy to get lost with, with gills in a mushroom. And then remember that we're, um, they're, they're getting fainter as they get towards the edge. So I almost messed up my, my gill um, line uh, just, just now, even though I was like warning about it. I can see he's using a uh, lost and found line. So when you have a line that sort of disappears for a little bit and then comes back, it can add a really nice quality to a drawing. He's using a fair amount of that in here. So in this step number four, we're going in there and look at how he's getting these ones darker and leaving these ones out, but he's also using these lost and found lines sort of throughout. And he's recommending using a, um, uh, como se llama? Uh, um, to kind of, you could potentially draw all these lines in and then come with a, um, a one of those rubber erasers, a kneaded eraser, and, and kind of erase like this, this spot here. I'm just going to do it with this um, eraser on my mechanical pencil. But if you have a kneaded eraser, um, go ahead and kind of erase a little bit there and you can see that you get a more subtle effect with the kneaded eraser because you can just squish it together push it down and then pull it up it's a really cool type of eraser actually bye kate okay next i think we're going to use he doesn't say it but it looks like he is using watercolor here already 
and he's probably using shadow violet. So um, actually, I guess I'm going to add a couple of these. I'm going to do a teeny bit of erasing before putting watercolor down. Watercolor can make it so that the graphite doesn't erase anymore. And go ahead and get your watercolor ready. I have two water brushes. I have one that is newer and puts out water faster. And I have one that's older, puts out water slower. Uh, next Sunday or this coming Sunday, I'm going to do a whole live show about using water brushes. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about is um, the flow rate. Because the flow rate on these is one of the, the main problems that people have with them. Uh, even people who've been using them for a while. So I'll talk about a couple tricks for, for dealing with that. And then I'm going to get my watercolor ready, and I'm going to go straight to Shadow Violet here. And um, it looks like a sort of medium tone that he's using for most of it. So I'll just mix a little bit of Shadow Violet here in the mixing area. And then... He says, draw in the, the shadows. Um, the, the foot is round, so the, um, the shadow should wrap around the, the round shape. And you can also see he is um, using sort of this, uh, it's a, uh, what's it called? It's a, uh, there's a term in figure drawing for the shadows that are like this. It's like a core shadow. See how there's actually a pale, rim around it it doesn't show up in his final painting though that's kind of interesting to notice but there's often this sort of lighter place at the bottom of the sphere so let's try to pay attention to that i think shadow violet um oh christine elder is watching on facebook thanks christine um we are going to um try to to reserve a little bit of white even though i think shadow violet is a non-staining color and then also you can see here on the stipe it's the same thing there's a core shadow so let's let's look at that as, as let's start there so what i'm going to do is i'm going to test how dark this is i'm going to come down here kind of go around here and then one thing we can do is we can spread it out from the core shadow afterwards and then let's get this one well it's, it feels really dark so i'm actually going to start up here Okay, so once we get down here, I'm actually going to lighten this a little bit. And I'm going to try to leave a little bit of this edge. Lighten it a little bit again. Kind of spread that out like that. And I want to get these dark though in there. A little bit of dark on this side. These are core shadows again. So you can see it doesn't, the shadow doesn't go all the way to the edge, but does soften a little bit on this side. It's not a, cast shadows usually have like a really harsh edge. And I'm going to soften the edge down here now that my brush is almost completely clean. I can come back and hit that and kind of create a little thing there. And I'll hit a little bit there too. Now I don't want it to be completely white. Okay, first pass on the shadows. Hi, Lynn. Um, the Sunday shows, I always try to make them at 1 p.m. So it should be 1 p.m. California time. So I'm in the Galapagos and there's been a lot of issues with the different uh, websites getting confused about what time zone I'm in. So it might show like it's going to be at a different time um, for your time zone, but it should be at uh, 1 p.m. California time on Sundays and 6 p.m. California times on Wednesdays is what I always shoot for. Good question. I've tried a bunch of different things to get the time zone right on the computer and it's none of them are working so far. 
but it's kind of amazing that this works at all from the Galapagos. So, and the internet is way better this year than it was last year. I wasn't able to do any YouTubes um, except YouTube shorts while I was here last year. Okay, so let's see what he says next. I think we basically finished number five. Hopefully um, you're, you're caught, all caught up. I might go in here and you know you could if if it's if it is a, a non-staining color you can kind of fuss with these and soften these edges a little bit uh if it's a cast shadow you usually don't want to do that because you want the stark um the cast shadows are are usually um have sharp edges oh the other thing that's going to be really important on a page like this is to put in um, something where you say that you're drawing like from John Mirla's book or you're drawing from a YouTube video so that it's clear that this isn't from like a mushroom that you found in your backyard. That's important for you. It's also important for, for if you share your work anywhere else. So I'm going to go ahead and I make, I'll make a little YouTube symbol for mine like that. Um, and then I could also make a um, book here and it's going to be page 254. Page 254, um, John Muir Laws, I put JML, JML's book. And that's that's all you need for, for metadata for this, in my opinion. But some way to know, um, I'm going to put NJ show. Some way to know that this, where, where this reference is coming from, I think is really important. Uh, Ivea, I don't think I'm teaching. I think I'm just, um, I was invited to, um, share in a panel with a couple other people about like, uh, nature journaling ad adventures or nature journaling and, um, challenging conditions or something like that. And yes, I will be talking more about wild wonder in the future. Um, uh, I'm excited about it and I will be, um, obviously covering it on the nature journal show just like last year. Okay, so up here, um, so we're done with number five. Here it's saying um, paint the cap um, following the, the contours with your brush strokes. Add uh, traces or lines with the gel pen, white gel pen, on some of the gills. A uh, key word there would be some, um, so don't do it on all of them. I'm noticing that I should make this sort of darker here. Um, and I'm going to need to wait for that to all dry before I can um, do the white gel pin, obviously. But I'm noticing, um, so check how dark your, your situation is because using white gel pin works best if things are actually pretty dark. So I'm going to actually come in here and just touch things up in a couple places to, to push the values just a little bit. So feel free to do the same. I just clean my brush off a teeny bit so that I can fade that edge, but I started with a darker and I'm going to try to take it closer to the edge this time because I think it'll make the um, white gel pen look better. Whoa, Terry already has hers, her tickets. Exciting. I oh, know I can't believe it's that time of year already. I don't even know where I'm going to be. I think I'll probably be in California this time. Last year I was in Quito. I, I, I got an apartment in Quito just for wild wonder basically um so that i would have good internet that whole month it ended up being kind of crazy because there was like construction going on in the apartment next door and some other stuff but um okay so let's wait for that to dry a little bit but our next step is going to be painting the cap um the top of the cap he doesn't say anything about what colors it's really interesting there's nothing in this one about colors he doesn't even say that he's using watercolor but uh that's fine. Okay. Okay. So what color do you think that, what color would you use for this cap here? That is the question. What color shall we use for that cap? My watercolors, it's been so humid here. My watercolors are starting to do that thing where they all goop, goop out. I'm going to take a little bit of this new Gamboge actually that I hardly ever use. It comes from like, I think Gamboge 
is like a French word for Cambodia or something. Oh, Hashi has her tickets also. Exciting. So I'm going to take this new Gamboge and maybe I'll add like a little bit of this buff titanium to it. Buff titanium is an opaque color and it's, it's really useful for a lot of things. So let's go through here and kind of, you can tell that it has more color at the top. It's like more saturated or, or warmer at the top, but then it, it fades as it comes down. So it seems like it has maybe more of the buff titanium and less of the other colors as it comes down. It's, it's pretty faint, so don't overdo, don't overdo the top. Like you can see mine is already more yellow than his. It, it, it almost makes it look like it could be a different species of mushroom. Like this color is actually looking more like a totally different species to me. And he's reminding us that the brush strokes um, should follow the, the contour of the cap. I didn't do a great job of that, but he's also going back with the pencil afterwards too. It looks like here is a zoomed in part of the edge of the gills. And this is before they have gotten highlighted with the, um, the, the white gel pen. It also looks like there's a little bit of a pink color along the edge. So once this is dry, we're going to come in here with pink because um, it looks like he added a little teeny bit of pink. Do you see that? Inside of there, you can really notice it in that crack. Um, in that crack there and along here, it looks like he's added a little bit of pink. I'm glad I chose this mushroom because I feel like it's a manageable thing and we're going to end up with a something that we'll feel good about. There's some in here that are way harder. Like I was thinking of doing some of these um, flowers in uh, uh, foreshortened flowers and these are really useful and, and you it improves your drawing skill. But I think like at the end of it, you don't necessarily end up with something that feels reward as rewarding. So there's certain exercises in here Sometimes you can tell by like if it's if it takes up the whole page, um, or if it's a two page um, a two page one. And I think on the Nature Journal show before we've done some of the ones that are two pages. Like, uh, let's find one that's two pages. The two page ones take way longer, and sometimes it can be really challenging. Like for example, this this one would be really hard. Um, I think I tried it before, but I might have lost patience. So this it just you can guess that it's going to be harder because it's two pages. But even some of these ones that require more of the work with perspective um, like this, there's no coloring at the end. So it's a little bit less rewarding. This is a good one because um, it's one of the ones. Where, but I mean, it's important just to kind of understand that that some of these you'll get a bigger dopamine reward and you're more likely to end up with something at the end that like looks really good. Whereas some of these are going to be um, a little bit harder. Like this is probably a good one. Um, and then like some of these reptile ones, for example, could be really challenging and you might not be um, that happy with the result at the end. This one's probably really challenging. Um, so just knowing that, that doesn't mean you shouldn't practice these ones, but you should just be prepared that maybe when you do these harder ones, you might not um, have that immediate like feeling of success at the end. Um, and if you have that feeling of success at the end of one like this, that doesn't mean like all of a sudden you don't need to practice anymore. It just means that that's partly because of this exercise. Ooh, cool. Thanks for sharing that. I think I listened to part of a podcast that talked about it. And I think it was being extracted in places in Indochina where there was like bullets left over from the Vietnam War and some of the trees or something crazy. Thanks for sharing that tidbit. Very cool. Okay, so um, now I'm going to add that pink. This feels like despite the extremely high humidity here, it has dried a little bit. So I'm going to add a teeny bit of pink, which I usually use this mixing area here. Uh, and, and don't overdo this. His is extremely subtle. So I'm just going around the edge there. 
I wonder if I can zoom in with it. Nope, I don't think I can zoom in. Bye, Ivea. Okay, that's enough of the pink. And then I'm going to come back with a little bit more of that new gamboge uh, mixture at the top, just because I want the top to be stronger and darker. And it looks like he's got these weird sort of lines, a couple of these weird lines coming down the, like that. All right. Uh, I don't really like the way that yellow is looking. Um, okay, so now we're almost ready to um, add the white lines. I'm gonna add some of the dirt. So it looks like he's got dirt here. He doesn't say anything about the, the dirt in this one. Um, not all of these have like super detailed stuff on every step, but you could probably figure figure it out. And it looks like he's using, I'm not super good with the browns, remembering the browns in, in the palette, but I think that's like raw umber. And he probably is using Bloodstone Genuine because he loves Bloodstone Genuine. Yeah, so look at that. Um, this is one of his favorite colors here is the Bloodstone Genuine, and that looks pretty close to that. Um, in fact, that might be like it. It doesn't really look like he has that much of that one, which is, what is that? That's like, I think it's burnt umber. Um, Italian, wait, there's Italian burnt sienna. Okay, so I know Monte Amiata natural sienna, Italian burnt sienna, and then burnt umber, burnt umber, raw umber. So maybe it has a little bit of the burnt umber, but a lot of the bloodstone genuine. I think I'm gonna do a video where I just talk about using, oh, look at that. Somehow I dropped a huge drop of brown watercolor paint on the bottom of my journal. Yay, that's always fun. <laughs> okay, let me clean that up real quick. Wow. That was a really concentrated, I think it just dropped, dripped out of my water brush. Okay, so I'm going to come in here. This part's a little bit scary because this is actually like one of the darkest, um, boldest things we're doing on here. But just showing a little bit the dirt, trying to make it random, don't over pattern it. See, it looks like his has more, um, more bloodstone genuine and less of the other stuff. So now while it's still a little bit wet, I'm gonna come in with more um, Bloodstone Genuine and I just took it straight out of the pigment. I didn't mix it in the mixing area. And some people say you, that's illegal, forbidden, and against the rules of watercolor, but I think sometimes you, you can definitely do it depending on the pigment. So we did it. And we put that brown in, and we're almost ready for well, I'm adding the white. One thing I'm going to do here is I'm noticing mine is way more saturated than his. So I'm going to think about, I could do the exact opposite of yellow and come in there with blue. But instead, I think what I'll do is I'll go into my gray area here, um, get a little bit of this gray, which has some blue in it, dilute it quite a bit, and paint a little bit over, over that yellow because it's too saturated. Let's see what that looks like. I'll try to, maybe I'll just try to make them look like little lines. It's a slightly dangerous move. Ah, don't ruin it. Maybe I'll make the shadow appear darker at the same time. Ooh, that might've been a dangerous move. Sometimes you have to ruin a, a few of these by, by going too far. You can learn stuff that time that, that way sometimes. Okay, now it's just a question of we're going to let it dry a little bit. We're going to add some final pencil marks. If you have a blow dryer at home, you could just blow dry this uh, really quickly. Great question, James. I think I am actually not going to use ink this time, but what I will try to do um, in a second, once it's a little bit more dry, is I'm going to come in with the pencil. And I think that I put 2B in here. 
So it's slightly, uh, slightly softer lead, and I will try to uh, darken some of these lines just with graphite. What I'm doing right now is also a bad idea. I am using an eraser while there's still wet watercolor. So if I were to blow on this right now, some of those little, some of that eraser dust is going to land on the wet watercolor and get stuck there and it can cause issues. So um, try not to do that if you don't have to. This is kind of fun. I, I haven't really used, um, I haven't really used graphite in a while. What is M-A-E-N? I don't know. I saw them post that earlier and I, I'm not totally sure. It, it must be some like inside joke between Ivea and uh, Kate or, or maybe something that came up at a recent uh, nature journaling thing. I don't know. Or, or maybe it's in, uh, maybe it came up in one of Jack's recent astro astronomical videos. All right. So if you have one of those like brushes for eraser dust, that could be a cool way to kind of, get get the dust out of the way without causing any problems. And then I'm just gonna really carefully check things on mine are still kind of wet. It's very humid here, so the watercolor dries quite slowly. You might be ready for the next stage, um, which would be getting your um, this white gel pen uh, all ready to go and um, doing some of these lines, which can be really, really fun. I'll put the link here for the white gel pen that I use. I think it's the same one that he's he's using here, but he even might be using it right there, but you wanna wait till things are really dry or else it's a problem. And it's also really easy to overdo it with this pen. You can definitely overdo it. So I'm just gonna wait a, a teeny bit more um, before I uh, put my white gel pin down. The other white gel pin that I recommend when you need bigger stuff is this one. So these are the two. There's a lot of uh, white white gel pin options out there that don't work great, but um, these two work quite well. I've tried a lot of different ones. Jack has tried a lot of different ones. Many people have tried a lot of different ones but these seem to be the best. I like these better than the Posca paint pins. I tried those for a little bit for my um, bigger option, but I don't like them as much. They're not as dependable. I think they're also more expensive. I do like the Posca paint pins for some other things, like for drawing on the cover. Um, it can be good for drawing on the cover of your nature journal on the outside. Drawing on the cover out here, it can work really well for that. And I think I even have some I don't have any drawings with it in here, but it, it can be fun for drawings inside too. I have been using more of these small sketchbooks that I can just keep in my pocket. Um, you can get these from Stillman and Byrne that have the same paper that you use in your large sketchbook, which is really cool. Uh, this is actually a paper I used to use in my nature journal. It's the same as the paper in this book, but you might notice it has an ivory color to it. Here's, some, uh, here's a lava lizard, a Galapagos lava lizard I nature journaled. Uh, the other day, some other Galapagos plants practicing geometric shapes. Um, I drew my dinner really quickly. Oh, thanks, Eli. That makes sense. Here's some crabs and lobsters. Uh, I practiced these cra crabs, drawing these crabs a lot, which was really fun. They were moving a lot. This is a really cute duck that I saw on the beach in the Galapagos. It's a Galapagos pintail, a statue of St. Francis, uh, a couple other small things. This was on an outing with the kids at the, the school where I'm working. That was really fun. Okay, 
Am I dry enough? Okay, I am, I think, dry enough. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to add in some darker pencil lines. So I'm going to emphasize this line up here. Boom. This should be completely dark right there. I'm going to emphasize a few of these coming down. This really doesn't look good if your paper is still wet. You could actually really damage the paper and it could be really bad, bad news. So you can see I'm just emphasizing a few of these lines coming down. Maybe I'll like emphasize this right here. Um, that a little bit here. So getting the practice of like how to emphasize some of these lines and not others is, um, is tricky and, and definitely some people um are better at it than others but it it is something that you can get you'll get better at with practice so definitely keep keep trying and i think it's one of those things that is actually easier with graphite so i'm going to put a couple of these lines up here there's a few lines on the cap mine's still a little bit wet so it's actually not ideal my line's not coming out great up there ah they're coming out pretty bad actually Notice I'm, I have sort of a vanishing line on the cap. I think I'm going to keep that way. Um, see how that's that's a cool thing to be able to do also is not outline everything. So notice how the top of that mushroom cap is not outlined um, very strongly. That's really important. And now the final step, get your white gel pen ready and don't overdo it. So it looks like he even goes over down here a little bit. Mine might still be wet. Um, so let's see here. Oh, a good thing to do is to always test it on another piece of paper first to see how it's flowing. These things can be a little bit fickle. Almost none of the opaque white tools are um, very great. <laughs> There's issues with all of them especially if you're sort of like more OCD or perfectionist, you might hate these. Sometimes like a huge glob will come out or it'll do something weird. Okay, I'm already close to overdoing it there. I'm gonna put like one coming, one teeny thing coming down here. I think Jack is good at, at, at these because he uses ballpoint pins a lot. Now I'm just gonna add a couple like weird squiggle things here. Oh, those, those look terrible. Over pattern them also. And boom, done. Okay, that is it everybody. Um, I hope you feel happy with the, the page that you did or if you're just hanging out and, and eating chocolate, that's cool too. I don't have any chocolate tonight, it's really sad. Um, so we did a page from the John Muir Laws book, Nature Journaling, um, from the book. I know a lot of us have this book at home and haven't done all the exercises. So if we can just spend a 40 minute, a 40 minute chunk of time, like every once in a while, we can, um, little by little check off more of these exercises in this amazing, but also overwhelming book. So let me know next time, which of these pages you want to do. I think I've done this on the Nature Journal show over five times um, at this point. We've done different exercises from his, his book. Um, next Sunday, I'm going to be doing um, a whole live show on using your water brushes. So I'll have a couple different sizes. I'll talk about um, different tricks, um, different issues with them. Um, and some of the things I've learned, I realized I've been using these for 10 years now. Um, so have a couple things to share a couple tricks and stuff like that to share so that'll be next sunday um thanks to all my patreon patrons it's my main source of income and uh, uh thank you all for supporting the show and check out the patreon even if you're not a member you can go on there and you can listen to the first minute of the mini podcast that i've been releasing from the galapagos a uh, couple um, exciting stories 
that I've been sharing on there, talking about some of the education projects that I've been doing, talking about some of the adventures, talking about battling the mold. Um, and I have a couple more new ones that are going to be posted soon. So go check it out on the Patreon page down, where is it? Down here, patreon.com slash Marley Pfeiffer. Um, and for $5 a month, you can sign up and support the show. Thanks to everybody who's supporting the show that way already. You're awesome. I think most of the people here tonight already are. Okay, see you on Sunday. Bye.